here, everyone. Welcome to dev stream number two for Expeditions Rome. It is really exciting to be here with everyone today. Um, I have with me my lovely guest, Jonas. Jonas, welcome again. Hello, nice to be back. Yeah, I'm the creative director in case anyone missed the previous stream. I'll oh, see, lucky for you, you get this big like uh, indicator right below your oh. face that tells you who you are the whole time. So no one can forget. Uh, uh, so yeah, no one also, everyone also knows who to blame, um, because the, the thing right there on the bottom, I love, uh, so I was, I was actually commenting uh, to Jonas about this before the, when we were doing stream prep, I absolutely love your shirt. Like, I don't know if everyone can see it, maybe you can lean up a little bit, but. Well, it's a uh, swag from uh, the previous game, Expedition Viking, yeah. So it's, it's not exactly right. Like, everyone on the team has one. But... That's awesome. Yeah, I think we're going to have to, uh, we were talking about this, I think, a couple weeks ago. We need to start thinking about uh, uh, Expeditions Rome shirts and figuring out what those would look like. Yeah, our, our art director is working on it because such an important task as designing a t-shirt obviously can't be left to anyone less important than the art director. So he's doing it himself. I actually think everyone's going to get a chance to meet our art director in a couple, uh, I think in like two streams. Um, so sneak preview, I guess. We're going to do a, an art stream coming up here in a little while and you'll get a chance to meet August. Um, maybe, maybe we could time, uh, that stream with the unveiling of the Expeditions Rome t-shirt. That could be a, that could be a thing. Sure, that's a momentous occasion, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That can tell, uh, get August, uh, some motivation that we can get the shirt design done and we can, uh, preview it and show it off for that stream. That'd be a lot of fun. How have um, you been, yeah. Jonas? I've been good, yeah. Busy, obviously, but, uh, chucking along, making progress. Nice to see everything coming together. Yeah, I know it's, uh, it's, it's... We're at those stages now where everything is slowly coming together and it's just really exciting to see all those pieces work together. Yeah, it really is. It's uh, especially good to see the levels that used to be gray box all of a sudden have all the particle effects and shader magic and all this kind of stuff coming in. It's really, really satisfying. Yeah. And I think, uh, so if, if everyone hasn't read yet, uh, today we're talking about combat, which, uh, so uh, last week we talked about kind of the game in general. And I think we did go a little bit into combat here and there as we were discussing it. Um, but if you haven't checked it out, we have a uh, dev diary that is posted on our community site, and that is uh, community.expeditionseries.com. We have that awesome link also. I'm not sure which corner I'm pointing to here, but in whatever corner that it's in. Um, and uh, those dev diaries are posted, um, and dev diary 2 is up about core combat. We have a nice uh, set of texts and details about how all that works, so we encourage you to go read it and check it out. But uh, during today's stream, we're actually going to dive into all the details of our combat system and, and discuss how it works. For some people that are familiar with, um, uh, you know, turn-based strategy games, I think um, a lot of it will be um, uh, comfortable for you and things that you've seen before. But there's a lot of nuances to Rome's combat, I think, that even from previous games like Vikings have changed um, in a way that I, I believe really make the, the, the combat a lot more exciting. So it should be a lot of fun. Yeah. Now, um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the... To jump right into the topic of, of the combat, the diary really starts with talking about the basics, but um, maybe you can kind of run us through some of those basics and, and, and how, like, um, like the game in and of itself is a role-playing game that combat then happens through a turn-based combat system. But with that role-playing side, you do kind of have that exploration element to it. So you're exploring the world, you're talking to NPCs, you're, you're kind of uh, uh, looting and looking around from things, and then combat can start. How does that work? That's exactly right. Um, as you are exploring a level, um, you might run into a group of enemies that have something to say to you, or they might even attack you outright in certain situations, which is typically pretty obvious when it's going to happen. A bunch of armed people waiting for you. Uh, it doesn't always start with exploration. Uh, one of the one of the things we lost from Conquistador when we when we changed to a more role playing game style game structure was this idea of of coming into a level and having the full tactical overview with options for where you want to deploy, which angle you want to come in from. So we're mm. bringing some of that back. We're reintroducing the preparation phase from, from Conquistador so that you have a chance to actually set up your team. That was one of the things people who played archers especially really hated in Viking was when they started a fight with a dialogue and they themselves were right up front because they were just talking to someone and now they... <laughs> They couldn't, they couldn't get away from that guy without, you know, getting hit in the face. Uh, so now you have a chance to pull yourself back and put your shield guys up front if you're in that situation. And in some cases, you might come into a level um, fresh from the world map and you'll have the run of the place, basically. You'll have many more options for where to set up. But a lot of the time, the fighting begins organically as you're exploring, as you're talking to someone, uh, and you'll be able to reposition and then begin the, the fight. 
Yeah, I'm curious how many people played Vikings in the chat. Um, I know there was one particular fight I remember. Um, it was in the main Viking town, and uh, you would actually, you were fighting. Uh, you walked up and talked to a dude, and if you had, like, a certain interaction, it'd start, like, a fight right away. And if you were, if you were like, a, a light or an, ar or an archer class, and you were talking to him, like, that first turn was really tough. Like, moving back was not an easy thing. You could really get ganked in that game if you weren't careful. And the way we handled enemy initiative and player initiative was also a little bit uh, inconsistent. Like, we were sort of trying to gauge how surprised you should be, who's, who's actually taking the initiative in this fight. And a lot of the time, the enemy would get to move before you did. Like, you might have just a little bit of movement to reposition in lieu of a preparation phase, but then they would get to attack you first. And yeah. Much rarer this time around. It's really when when you're when you're completely caught with your pants down. That's when they get to act first. But in the vast majority of cases, you you get the first to move. So I think we have some gameplay video we can play while we're talking about this. And um, uh, when the gameplay video is rolling here in a second, you'll be able to see like some of this preparation phase that we're talking about in that first scene. I think in this first video sample, um, and we'll probably just play it on loop as we're talking back and forth. But you have like this um, exploration part where you're walking up, and then all of a sudden you hit this combat encounter, and you see that preparation phase. And in that phase, uh, you know, most combat situations, just one area, but there's even some where you have multiple areas that you can kind of deploy your units in before you even start that first turn. Exactly. Especially if you're coming in from the world map, you might have multiple different locations where you can deploy your people. Sometimes we deliberately split up the uh, preparation phase into a couple of areas adjacent to each other where you're not allowed to put everyone in the same position. So you have to kind of think about... Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, just to kind of give you the extra bit of... Uh, well... A difficult decision to make essentially then we're putting in a half piece yeah i know uh we haven't really talked about we, we've teased this a couple times there are some very epic uh um uh combat experiences in expeditions rome uh one of them that we've, we've we've teased but not said anything about is this idea of sieges which are um multi-phase kind of like big fights that happen in certain parts of the game's experience and uh, in some of them, the preparation phase is super important because you like where you put people in and which ones you want to have. Um, uh, again, I don't want to give too much away, but there's one where like you have to deal with like multiple catapults that you're trying to 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 to, to handle, and you have to like decide who goes after which one, and that's part of the experience. It's actually quite fun. Yeah, yeah, and also the 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 places where you're allowed to to place your people initially can depend on which angle uh, you approach the combat from. In some cases, like if you explore and circle around the back you might have a different positioning setup there that could be more or less the disadvantageous depending on your uh, your party so absolutely makes sense so yeah. um so um now we've kind of gone through like like some of the different scenarios around how that preparation phase works now that combat has started you have to move your units around so how does movement work in expeditions roam every character has a certain number of movement points uh you can use okay. them in any order you like, you can you can use them partially. It doesn't end your turn like in certain other games. Uh, so you have more freedom to maneuver and position your people and switch back and forth to make sure that you get a good setup for using your skills optimally. Uh, of, of course, that's particularly important if you're planning to use an area of effect skills. It's nice to be able to move a character out of the way before you nuke that whole area. Yeah. Um, By the way, just to jump in, so Tabor, yes. So um, he's asking a question where he's actually surprised that you have open world movement as well as turn-based combat. And that's actually one of the cool things about Rome's combat system and how it ties to the role-playing game side. So you absolutely have, it's, an, it's a role-playing game. You get to explore, talk to NPCs, interact with the world, and then you, you know, combat can happen either through a dialogue experience or through triggering, and you get that first kind of preparation phase set up, and then you start moving your units around and doing your turns. So yeah, it's it's, it's both sides. You get the exploration and the, the turn-based combat together. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to answer that. Question real quick. Oh, it, it's important to get that out of the way, yeah, because it is very much an RPG first and foremost with the turn-based combat. So all of the RPG stuff happens in real time, of course, with running around and, and talking to people and finding you and so on. Um, the, awesome. uh, Actually, so you have yeah. like uh, movement points and you use that to kind of move through the spaces with your units each turn. Yeah, exactly. And we're giving you quite a lot of movement points. Um, it, uh, there's many ways to both increase and decrease that, but by default you can move quite a lot of combat. So so. Uh, positioning becomes very important, but you do have a lot of freedom. Uh, you need to read the environment so that you know where to place your people to lock down choke points and so on. Um, but you are, you are, you're able to maneuver quite a lot. And there are some skills, um, you know, I've, I've been encouraged to mention the marathon skill, which is one of the high tier leg ones where you can essentially move an unlimited um, distance 
but you only but you have to kind of pick the path that the, that the pixel being picked. So you enable it, you can click pretty much whatever you want. And your and, and your character will run up there, but you have no control over the path that you take. Which oh be crazy. Bad. I actually don't think I've seen that skill before. That's kind of fun. Uh, is that yeah, is that a is that a, a class it's, skill? It's a like, class skill. Yeah. And it, it, um, it, can, oh. it can definitely set up some really crazy scenarios. You can really blast the entire battlefield with it, but you're putting yourself in a lot of risk because you never know what kind of attacks of opportunity you'll take. I have to I have to uh, to pause my my producer brain for a second because I've actually I've not messed with that skill before. It's probably deep in one of those trees, and this is the first time I'm hearing about it. That sounds really interesting, actually, yeah. especially with. So actually, we have we have a cool screenshot that could maybe even communicate how this works. There's um a screenshot that we have prepped for talking about movement, and um, you can actually can see like the two, so there's like two different tiers of movement, right? You have like the the safe, like uh, you still have your action point movement, and then you have the one where you're kind of like sprinting to get to a farther farther distance. Um, and the image you can kind of see uh, once it's pulled up here. I'm waiting for the um, the confirmation that it's up on the screen. Um, there's a um, you actually can see like the UI elements communicating to you like where the green movement ends and the yellow movement starts. And the yellow movement is the one that has the um, um, is the sprint part. But uh, part about that the whole that choke point part is that we also have um, it's called like uh, attacks of opportunity, right? So things that happen if you walk by someone if they're like if they're a melee unit. Yeah, um, exactly. It's if they are a melee unit specifically, if they have a melee weapon equipped, if they're unarmed, they don't get attacked. Oh, right, right, right. Sorry. Right. Um, Good yeah, point. That's, that, that's fine. And they are, that is a way for, for melee characters to kind of knock down ranged characters, especially, uh, but really anyone in melee combat uh, to prevent them from running away. And you incur an attack opportunity from a character if you are moving through their threatened space. So if you're moving, if you're leaving one of the hexes adjacent to them, they get to attack you, but they can only make one such attack per turn. So you can also use that to plan uh, soaking that attack with someone who has a shield, for example, so that a more squishy character can get away from from that threat. So you know, like the time we were talking about that marathon skill, like you may go a far distance, but if you can't control which path they take, you could take like multiple attacks of opportunity while you're weaving through the lines to get to where you want to go. Yeah, so it becomes a, a a bit of a puzzle almost in some cases of, of yeah, where do yeah. I want my start position to be so that I can get close enough to my end position without having to run past anyone who's going to hit me uh, on their way past. And then of course he... there's also skills you can use to deal with those uh, attacks of opportunity. Like if you activate uh, tactical retreat, for example, so that you don't take any attacks of opportunity, that makes that puzzle a whole lot simpler. And so as you see on the screen right there on the screenshot, like the green dotted line, this is a move command. So the, the unit's trying to move from one part of the map to the other. And the green shows kind of like that first movement point section. And the yellow is when you're moving and also consuming an action point at the same time. So that's like the sprint move that takes you as far as you possibly can go. Um, and so so this kind of uh, leads into, I guess, the, the second part of how combat works, which is um, we talked about moving a little bit and how movement works, but how do action points work? What are those? What are those things? has one of them um very very rarely a powerful character might have two um you also have ways of getting it back but many skills require that you spend your action point to use that skill uh, and there are skills that don't require it. skills that are either charge based for example where you can only use them a certain number of times every encounter but then they might not cost an action point so there's something you can use on top of your action um, or you may have one that's completely free but it's some sort of restriction um okay for example, like classes have a focus that they build up gradually through the game, and you can sometimes use focus as a currency to activate a skill instead of something else. Like uh, and you so can then also, as you mentioned, it's really like the the things that you use to do attacks and 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 buffs and all that kind of stuff. Versus, um, I guess there's also some like utility kind of things that you can do that are maybe outside of that sometimes in rare situations. Yeah, as a general rule, doing anything costs your action point, but uh, then there are exceptions to that rule. And there's actually quite a few exceptions, so it might not be the best rule. Um, and then, as you mentioned, you can also uh, exchange your action point to be able to, to double move, uh, essentially. Right. And the range of your movement is based on, and I think we actually we skipped over this for a second. So like the, you can move further if you have like different uh, types of armor on, so, right? Like there's like an actual movement distance um, that is based on like light, medium, heavy armor. I, I don't actually remember what the armor classes are, but different classifications of armor. Yeah, I don't know if we'll get into that later, but yeah, we have basic, light, medium, strong, and heavy armor. Uh, and every character has eight movement points by default, and then that movement is reduced by a certain number based on how heavy your armor is. So heavier armor reduces movement more. 
And then okay. you have perks that you can take if you're certain classes that reduces that penalty to allow you to move further in, in heavy armor and so on. Yeah, I think we have a couple of screenshots we're going to throw up there that actually shows the difference from the in the inventory UI where you're like sitting there with like a light armor class and you have, I think, like one movement point or two move, or sorry, like five or six movement points. And then you have the guy with like the shield and the sword and like the big thick armor and he has one, like he can only move a very short distance. It certainly shouldn't be one, but uh, he might have uh, a leg injury that further reduces his movement. There's all sorts of things uh... that can happen there. Uh, but uh, it, generally, you'll have a very bad time if you end up having only one movement. That, that right, makes okay. you fairly immobile. So, um, with the, um, we were talking about the, so the, the different, uh, yeah, we have the UI up now, so you can see there on the bottom right corner, um, there's a little foot icon. It has a one for the heavy dude. Maybe he is injured. I don't know. And then it has the other guy who has like a six on it. So uh, you can see the differences there. Now, um, when you take actions, you were talking about how those are based, those basically power, um, <clears throat> are powered by skills and whatnot. So, um, like, do you actually have like attacks that you can do or, or is it? Our actions just like how, how does the, the the action system work when it comes to what things your character actually can do aside from moving? Yes, your skills can come from two different places, as you're alluding to. They can come from your class. You have certain skills that your class gives you as you level, uh, and you can you can bring six of those skills in. You can unlock many more of them, than level, but you can bring up to six of them into a, a character. Uh, but most of your attacks will be coming from the weapons that you uh, that you find throughout the game. So each weapon has a number of skills that it can um, make available to you if it is equipped. And you can bring three of those for each loadout into, into a battle. You can have two different loadouts. So you could have a sword and a shield in, in one set. And then in, a, in your alternate set, you could just have like a spear. Or a yeah. And then that um, that gives you different sets of, of, of weapon skills that are available to you, which are usually yeah, offensive skills. So I, I want to ask Chad a question here because we Jonas and I actually had a debate. <clears throat> we were working on the uh, the Dev Diary, which if you haven't read the Dev Diary, community.expeditions.com, um, you can read Dev Diary too on all the stuff we're talking about here. How many of you in chat? Now I'll let this question sit, and then we'll come back to it um, maybe later. How many of you in chat know what I mean if I say white damage? And Jonas and I talked about this one right in the Dev Diary because I I brought up I actually uh, you know had. Uh, written the the phrase white damage when talking about this because our game doesn't have white damage it only has uh skill based damage um and you know it's like i don't i actually I, I heard that phrase before but i'm not sure how many people would would know what that means so i'm just curious in chat like how many of you guys if i say white damage um isn't in our game how many would know what i was talking about um and that's i, I think it's one of like the, the my favorite things about um uh uh expeditions rome is that you don't really have like every uh attack you do has character or personality to it it's not just like a flat oh i'm doing 30 damage or 25 damage it is all based on an action that does other things yeah exactly so so uh meta i'm gonna slaughter this guy's name uh meta chow i hope i got that right i'm i'm, I'm famous for getting names wrong uh white damage is like an auto attack it's like just a baseline attack that has no special modifiers to it exactly yeah we really wanted to get rid of those uh, we find that um with with viking we, we offered all of these different skills and abilities to the player, and then you would end up spending 80% of your time just left-clicking on a character to just swing your sword, and, and that was it. Like you would be ignoring all these extra skills because mostly what you want us to do is just deal damage. Uh, and then, of course, we, we've, we've added a lot of damage to skills that might not otherwise have them. Um, that mm -hmm. way, the, the extra things that skill can do, the things that gives that skill personality become like a bonus thing on top of the damage. So you're not sacrificing the DPS in order to do interesting things. You'll always be dealing damage to some extent, but you'll be doing extra things or you'll be dealing the damage in interesting ways, as you say. Like maybe if you can yeah. position yourself right, you can damage two characters at the same time if the pattern of that skill is correct. And that makes the just the moment-to-moment -moment decision making so much more fun and interesting than, than it used to be. Yeah, I remember when you guys first started talking about this back, you know, year and a half, whatever it was ago. And, um, you know, my initial reaction is, oh, man, that's like, it's a really cool concept. But you're talking about creating a unbelievable number of like unique behaviors for all of these weapons in order to create the diversity and range. And uh, that has been a challenge, but I think it's turned out quite well. Like there's a lot of um, excitement, like when you get a new Gladius or Spear or whatever, um, it's not like just a damage value that determines like how strong it is. It's really like the layout of skills that creates the uniqueness and the excitement around what you're you're getting a chance to play with. 
Yeah, the, the funny thing about that is it, it originally came up as a, as a mechanic that we could potentially explore in future games. We were talking about what are we going to do after Expeditions Rome? We should, we should uh, come up with some crazy new twist on the turn-based charm run. One of the ideas we had there was to, have, uh, to get rid of the basic attack. Um, and the more we talked about it, the more we realized like, we should just like, do it now, like carpe diem, right? Yeah. You never know if there's even going to be a next game. Like, like, we're doing a game right now, we should use this awesome idea in that game. So yeah, it was a bit late to do that change, but I mean, we managed it. Yeah, yeah. And well, hi, Kermit, uh, Kermat the Frag. Good to see you, man. Um, so I really, it's 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 crazy because like it, it's it's now for us, it's it's we've been doing it for so long, it feels like just a natural decision. But if you, I mean, and I'm not gonna. This is not me talking bad or good about any other product. But it's like when you look at other games, uh, not even just turn-based games, but role-playing games. Like the idea of not having a basic attack or a wide attack for a weapon is really dangerous. Like no game really does that because it's it's like that's how you evaluate how strong a weapon is like it's it's base damage and how much it does when it's not doing anything else is a big part of how how people evaluate weapons and how they work so to remove that concept and make everything skill based it's like i mean now how do you evaluate power relatively because it's like is one skill more powerful than another it creates a whole bunch of interesting question marks that were a little bit uh scary for us at first i think but as we kind of dived into it and I mean, the game has been broken many times this development because of this decision as we've been trying to figure out how to tune it. Um, it's really worked out well. I mean, and I, I obviously you guys will evaluate it when you have a chance to play the game in a while, but like, in my opinion, something that I thought was gonna be a big risk and a weakness has turned out uh, to be a really exciting strength. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it makes the game's combat come to life. It's one of my favorite things about the game now, yeah. And, uh, yeah. It, it certainly, Brought with it its share of UI design challenges, but uh, it's worth it. Yeah, yeah. I love how uh, um, Meta Chow has now interpreted my my attempting to be a, a good comment to all other games are awful. <laughs> I'm not Which gonna. Is, I mean, objectively true. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know what you. I, but it's 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 uh it's it's um, you know, part of the inside of being a game developer, right? Like, uh, we we all. Uh, share and learn from other titles and they learn from us and it's part of like I think it's it's like a collective knowledge base of designers and developers trying different things and experimenting so whenever you try to do something that's a little bit more new and unique I mean maybe someone else has done it and you haven't seen it before but there are like standards that get based in certain genres like dialogue trees or how like level up works or whatever like there's these things that get built in the collective knowledge of gamers as you play so when you try to do something different it's like man like Hope it works because we can get like a year and a half or two years down the road from now. And if it doesn't work, then we're kind of screwed. Like <laughs> you can't like once yeah. you try the risk thing, it's 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 um, so it's 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 fun that it's worked out so well. And if well, it does uh, work, then hopefully someone will steal it because it's cool. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, you never know. Or maybe we'll just keep using it for our other games. Right. Um, this is only game three in the series. We got we got like infinite more to go. Right. There's a whole bunch of numbers. So, um, and a lot of settings too. So uh, we're gonna bring, um, uh, uh, we're gonna say adieu to um, Jonas for a little bit. We're gonna bring him back later on for the Q&A section of the stream. Um, but we're gonna actually change out now and Jonas, we'll, we'll see you in a minute. Uh, and we're mm -hmm. gonna bring on Hans, um, our combat designer, and we're gonna talk about these skills in a little more detail. So um, Hans, welcome to the to the stream and say hi everyone to, in Twitch land. Hi everyone. I am the combat designer, my name is Hans, and I'm happy to be able to share some of the stuff we've been working on for Rome. Um, little sad that I didn't get to talk about all the stuff you guys just went through because I love it just as much as you guys do. But uh, we got more stuff to, to talk about, right? So I think we should just keep on going. Yeah, now we have the Hans reveal hype. I love it. Actually, so um, Hans, I haven't met you before. I'm going to share a little bit of knowledge I just learned about you for the first time uh, in our stream prep. So supposedly back in the older days of Twitch, Hans was a budding uh, level design streamer. You did a very short-lived but seemingly very popular uh, uh, Twitch channel for um, showing like actual like level design work back a number of years right. ago. Is that, is that true? That's true. I was uh, I was still doing my my bachelor studies, um, actually finishing the actual the, the final product we was doing there on VR, I believe, and I was working uh, maybe half time on this game called Battle Souls at the time, and I was just like in all my spare time be streaming, doing level design. Having a good time in my shabby apartment back then, uh, but enjoying it so much because people are interested in games and 
and and so am I. That that's why I love doing this stuff and why it's nice to be back on camera five years later. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. Uh, it it's uh it's it's one of the reasons why I love doing these dev streams. And uh, you know, obviously, I think our audience will grow over time. And uh, hopefully, everyone here that's uh, the, your first time to a dev stream, um, we're gonna do these every two or three weeks um, right now. So like, uh, and I think we already have the the next topic uh, posted. Um, in about three weeks, we're gonna have uh, Dev Diary number three coming out, which is on our story. And then we're also gonna have Dev Stream number three. So we'd love for you guys to get involved and attend multiple of these. And like Hans mentioned, like um, it's fun talking to people who are interested in how games are built. You know, like, obviously we, we, we like love talking about um, our game and the features of it, but there's a science, I, I honestly think it's a science, but also an art to building these games and, and sharing um, that process with people and letting them see how we create these games that hopefully they love is, I, I don't know, I love it. It's fun to, to watch the community get excited about that. Definitely. And I, I think we actually have some really interesting tech that enables a lot of the cool stuff we can do in combat um, for Rome. But it also, like, there's always upsides and downsides to the to the road you decide to go with, especially when it comes to programming. Once you have a back end of code, it's kind of, that's how the, the fundamentals are. You can't really change those rules. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So um, uh, you're the combat designer. So your your role in the project is. I mean, obviously, I'm sure you do a lot of different things. It's a it's a relatively small team, so everyone has their hands in multiple uh, pots. But your main job is to design the combat system and implement the combat system. Yes. So this topic is like, this is the kind of thing you could talk about all day. I imagine. Pretty much, it's the kind of thing where whenever I come up with something cool, which in my opinion is every day. I want to tell my fiance about it and she gives me like five minutes and she's like, okay, now, now stop because you can just keep on going. And, and I think we should keep this thing, the same thing. I mean, if people want to know as much as, as they do, they can just ask on, on Discord, right? But, um, I think we should dive into some of the, the basics, but really cool stuff like you guys have been doing so far and continue on there. Awesome. So, uh, this is the, uh, you guys should get to know Hans very well. So if there's any balancing breaking issues, he's going to get to blame, um, in a number of months when the, you know, when we finally start doing release and, and demos and whatnot. So, um, let's go into, so Yo I think Jonas gave us a really good overview of all the basics. We were talking about skills and equipment a little bit. We showed like the UI with uh, the different movement things. There's one basic element about combat that we didn't talk about with Jonas though. And I think it'd be, it, it's super, super important. We kind of alluded to it with one of those images we showed. We had the um, the guy with the, um, the the sword or the spear and the big shield. Um, shields are a really big part of how combat works in Expeditions Rome. They are, they're a really big part. And they should be because you're playing as, as a Roman and especially from the time period there that we're playing in, shields were a big thing. The scutum is like, anyone sees that shield, they, they pretty much know what it is, where it's from and where they got their military power from. So that's also yeah. why we kind of wanted to, to build a lot into the shield. Yeah, I mean, Ro Ro Roman history is famous for their shields, I guess, right? Like, yeah. That was a big part of um, the, 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 the way that they had, like, they're, you know, now we have, like, the modern version of, of high technology, which is all of the stuff with, like, jets and whatnot. But back then, like, mm -hmm. shield tech was the future jet. Like, that was a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So yeah. how do shield so, Why don't you can give us a quick overview of how that, that works as far as combat design is concerned? So uh, shield and Vikings are essentially, no, in Expeditions Rome, I'm sorry. Uh, their weapon and and Jonas actually hates. Yeah, Hans is distracted by Jonas's awesome shirt. He can see Jonas right now in the corner. Yeah. He just says Vikings across his chest. So it's. And I don't idea. have. I don't have that shirt, and I'm I'm kind of jealous. He's jealous. That's why. Sorry. So Rome, no. right? How does it work in Rome? Uh, in Rome, the <laughs> the shield is a weapon, and Jonas kind of hates whenever I said that. But technically, uh, the shield is a weapon. You equip it like you would a sword. You would a spear. And it's only one of our classes, the heavy classes, that can equip a shield, kind of determining okay. what they're about in the, the encounters that we have. And then what happens to them is that they get a bonus health pool of shield strength is what the stat is called. Some shields will have less shield strength, others will have more. And that means that you can essentially soak more damage every turn. Because the thing with shield is that it usually, rather than depleting them completely, which you, you would see in a lot of games, and it also works quite well, what we do is that every turn, your shield strength or your extra health pool kind of replenishes up again um, mm. by a certain amount. And the way we actually came up with this idea was that rather than like, breaking a shield is quite hard, especially with a spear or with uh, a sword. So rather than seeing it as your shield being destroyed, the shield strength more represents the stamina of the character. 
every turn you can take uh, X amount of attacks before your your arm kind of dwindles down and you're open to to other attacks. You get exposed, um, but once it becomes your turn again, you kind of recover some of that shield strength and we'll be able to to take more hits consecutively. So Stefan or Steven, I, I'm guessing it's Stefan one. Stefan one asked a question that will always come up, and maybe this is why Jonas doesn't want you to ever say that shields are a weapon, but now you've said it, it's too late. You cannot say that and not expect the next thing that someone asks is, can I dual wheel shields? Like, it's literally going to be the very next thing someone says immediately. So, I mean, can you dual wheel shields? Um, no. No. Uh, <laughs> if, if, I, if I wanted to make something that was dual wheel shields, we could do that technically, but we, we don't want that in the game. Shields, however, uh, and, and I think where it kind of gets interesting. Well, if you guys really love the game, we'll do DLC dual wielding shields. I, we're, we have DLC designs floating around right now. Jonas is shaking his head in the background, but like, I, oh. it's like the, the, the idea of dual wielding shields is always, I think everyone always thinks about that. They're like, well, if I can like do this with one shield, can I do this with two? Like, <laughs> no. No, I, I think actually what I talked about there, it, really explains why you can't it's stamina so you would like equip two shields and you would have half the stamina because you need to wear double as much it, it just doesn't work right we're not gonna have two shields in that game i'm sorry chat no dual building shields it's my say one i think i think he's throwing a gauntlet down to you if you guys start so we have another community that we chat with here on on, on our, our twitch channel from knights of honor i already see the ghost thing coming up there's this whole like thing that has happened over the course of time to get goats into a, another game uh, maybe if the community pushes enough, we can find a, a small shield-based weapon. I know you guys are going to hate me for suggesting this, but all right, let's let's get on from the shield thing. So I I, I actually think that's very interesting because I um I never we've you know, the shield mechanic has been in the game for a long time. The recharging shields. I never knew the idea, the fantasy behind it was recovering stamina. That's that's that that makes sense. So it's like you get tired from holding your shield or taking all these hits and eventually you're exhausted and that exposes you to actual attacks to your to your body, to your health. Yeah, that at least was my philosophy and I think one thing that really represented it as well is that um, shields also have since they're weapons, they have weapon skills on them. As Jonas explained earlier, we have skills coming from weapons and we have mm. skills coming from your class. So for the shields, we'll have something that reinforces your shield, something that pushes enemies, that stuns enemies, something which just deals damage, that's something which you sometimes need. And you're not able to perform those if you don't have any stamina. Like, how are you going to be bashing someone with your shield if you don't even have stamina left for blocking an attack? So right. another mechanic that Jonas talked about previously was attack of opportunity, how you would get hit um, as a reaction by enemies when you move away from them. You might actually decide to do that sometimes uh, when carrying a shield because you don't take any like perma penalty to your health pool. You take it from the shield. If you can be certain that you won't be shot by an arrow, for example, well, then you just took it from the shield. The shield come back up. It's all fine. But you won't be able yeah. to then use like a shield bash because you just use just stamina on blocking. Yeah. So I think it's very interesting because um, <clears throat> when we first added this mechanic in the game, it was actually super, super broken, like absolutely broken because shields would recharge every turn. And it basically meant that you had to like do, you had to focus fire a dude down with shields in order mm -hmm. to kill them. And every turn you had to like refocus fire all this damage down and they become like massive damage soaks. And another interesting thing about shields that um, you kind of hinted at there, we haven't talked about directly yet, is that um, shielded characters cannot take um, uh, arrow damage or any kind of range damage until the shield is depleted. So that they block all of the um, range yep. attack until it's gone. They deflect it. So there was a whole set of mechanics around it. I think we've done a really good job of tuning that since then. And one of the ways we've tuned it is that, like you said, shields don't repair themselves all the way, but there are moves that kind of recharge them all the way if you want to. So like you have that kind of skill system where it's like, are there maybe skills that I decide to bring into combat where I can recharge my shield every turn fully, but that is a skill that I have to deploy. Or there's skills that uh, increase the total amount of shield uh, health bar. So even though it may get depleted, that that free recharge every turn may be enough to keep my shield kind of topped off. So there's, there's a lot of different dynamics that you bring to play when it comes to how shields get depleted and refilled and recovered um, that help make those characters really interesting to play as opposed to like super OP tank walls. Yeah, and it's something we really wanted to do in comparison to Viking where essentially every class could could do anything, uh, maybe a little better or worse, depending on where your start point was, but everyone could kind of become the same character, um, which would end up being the tendency and not as interesting. So we brought down, brought back these four different classes to 
expeditions roam and kind of to establish these core fantasies. Um, so initially, when when kind of building on upon your team, you just have the like the heavy class that we are talking about right now. You might want to just go for the the shield wall, right? Like you just want the scutum to never go down, and you want to be able to soak as much damage as possible. Which is a playstyle that's very appealing, very interesting. But other yeah. guys are like, nah, this guy is up front all the time anyway. He's surviving pretty good. Let's just make him as like as beefy as possible and hard hitting. Something where his shield yeah. hits hard and he stuns characters and he runs characters over and he kind of you kind of get that brute with the shield, but in a different mindset. And we really want to take these classes and let the player explore the, some different core fantasies that are appealing in these settings. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I apologize because your name is both long and hard to pronounce. Yeah. Um, but uh, we had a question on chat from Voren Weir... Oh my lord, how do I even pronounce that one? <clears throat> Voren Weirokorm, I'm going to just slaughter it. I'm going to call you Vor, because Vor is a, Voren's a short way to say that name. Uh, so Voren asked if there's any shield wall dynamics. And this is an interesting... <clears throat> We had this conversation a lot on the project because one of the fantasies that everyone immediately has with the whole idea of Rome is like the, the shield wall, like a wall of soldiers that kind of walk forward. And we tried and actually discussed different ways we could do that. And with the number of units you have in like the normal baseline turn-based combat, that never really worked with the fantasy that we were creating. But map design is a big part of how combat plays out. And the shielded characters can block a passage both completely by just standing in a one hex spot where you can't walk through, or they can block a passage by making it really dangerous to try to walk through it because of the tax of opportunity. So you can, like, there are definitely quite a few combat encounters where having two shielded characters kind of in those choke points creates that, the virtual shield wall. Like it's not like a line of five soldiers standing there, but it still has that kind of impact where it's like the enemy is probably either not going to go through it or going through that's going to be very, very costly. And that allows your other damage characters and maybe your your spear guys that have an extra range attack or your archers to do other actions while your shields kind of hold that line. Exactly. And I mean, we just a pro tip here. I think you should maybe always have two guys with the shield and exposition roam. Uh, not that we want to limit you in any way. Uh, it, it is well, possi possibly possible to beat the game just with like six archers. Um, but generally having the, a good mix of the different classes makes sense and at least two shield guys makes up for a lot of options We actually since we're talking shield ball We have like I know one pike ability which actually gains extra damage per adjacent shield character that you have So let's say you have five characters right. with with a shield and you're just standing like in between all of them And you skewer someone with your pike that's going to deal a lot of extra damage And that's kind of some shield ball stuff going out there and then as you said positioning yeah. like you could essentially block five hexes by having two shield guys with two hexes apart or one hex apart, because then they will have to take attack opportunity walking past them. Yeah, I think what you're alluding to even with some of these things we're talking about now is that there's just this like almost, um, I don't want to say it's a puzzle because it's not quite a puzzle, but there's, there's, there's so many different ways that you can take the different skills and mechanics and um, leverage them in a way that you want to play combat. Like if you want to do four shield dudes and a spear with that bonus, you could try that. If you want to do two shields and like three archers, you can. If you want to do more of a mixed party with different ranges of skills that are more utility based on the circumstance, you know, the way the mechanics work and the way the skill systems work, it does give you tremendous range uh, for trying different strategies. Yeah, it's, it's something that you definitely could also do in Viking, but I just wanted to take even further for Rome. Uh, it's something, when whenever I'm playing other RPGs, I kind of call it build theorizing, where essentially yeah. you just, you, once you've played the game for like 100 hours, you know all the tools and you just go like, okay, let's let's see what kind of fun thing we can put together here. And you go like, okay, I need these amount of stats and I want to use this okay. skill just because it's cool. And then suddenly you find, yeah, it, it's not far from a puzzle, as you say. But experimenting with stuff and kind of creating your own story in combat, I think, is is a huge part of fighting in RPGs and it's something that I even do sometimes for ju just for fun. Not to do the optimal thing, which sounds very like what you should do in a tactical game. Just do what's cool. Like, you're the super warriors from Rome, right? Just do something cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's um. <clears throat> so we're, we're talking about story uh, on our next diary and stream, but in a way, this kind of applies to the theory and, and kind of the core um of expeditions rome as a game i mean we really um it's an rpg but the rpg has uh, an element to it where you play 
the character you want to play and the story reacts and evolves to you. It has so many branching storylines. I feel like the writers want to just jump out of a window half the time um, because even one change, cha yeah, Jonas is nodding at me in the background. Like it just changes so many things when you even like make one decision because there's so many different decision points. And so there's this idea of like, it almost has that kind of, um, you know, Knights of the Old Republic-esque kind of thing where you want to play multiple times to try different story paths but then we had to also find ways to do that with the combat mechanics too. So it's like, when you're going through in one round, you may play with the optimal build, right? And, you, and this is the way you're gonna play with these different characters. And then you're gonna go play a second time through and maybe this time you're gonna be like, more of a, a super aggressive personality in your role playing game fantasy. And you're like, screw it, I'm gonna do all shields and no rain. Like, it's gonna be shields and, and, and melee weapon guys. I'm gonna see if that works. It's gonna be all just like, brutal combat or maybe it's unarmed or who, who knows? you can like mess with both combat fantasies and role-playing fantasies at the same time and see how those different mechanics come together and it makes the game fresh like it, it makes each encounter like wow i did it this way the last time but now i don't have those skills so what in the world am i gonna do now like it's a very different um game each time through it is one of the like core pillars of expeditions altogether not just rome but it's like moment to moment, unique player stories. Not just that the story is unique and branches a lot, but also that the story can be yeah, unique yeah. To, to the player. Because one encounter, whether it's like two different people playing the same encounter, whether the same story behind the same enemies are there, it's never going to be the same. Like the AI is going to behave a di bit differently. Your damage rolls are going to be differently, your decisions, etc. And the same thing on the world map, there's random stuff happening to you there. Meaning that once you have the story and then all the random stuff and your decisions happening around it, you get a different version of the story that any other player does. Absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be, I don't know if we'll talk about world map events and the first story dev diary, because we're going to really dive into like the plot and the, the, the mm -hmm. what is the main core of the story about. But I mean, it's, it's, if anyone has read any of the, uh, um, the, the preview articles from some of the awesome um, press out there that have been so kind to us uh, after we announced the game, like the scope of Rome is huge. There's so many different things that are like stacked upon, stacked upon, stacked to create that variation. And I, I think, I don't know, I try not to make super bold statements uh, 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 about projects that I'm working on, but it's like, it really is a unique experience every time through. And those, the combination of like, what skills you're getting from certain weapons that are rolling, what uh, uh, choices you make in the story, what events hit you, as well as like, there's also the core quests, but though, even those core quests have different, fractures based on which choices you make. I mean, it creates this really unique experience every time. And, and it, we talked about on the combat side, we actually talked about uh, an example in the dev diary that is another version of what you were talking about with the shield, right? So, you know, Hans was mentioning the idea of like a shielded guy um, that could boost because he's standing there, a spear guy because of a skill on the spear, right? The spear gets a bonus being next to shielded guys. Um, the, there was this um, skill set we were talking about for the archers. So the archers have this base class skill that's called ranging shot that you can get. And ranging shot basically exposes um, uh, a target. And so if they're exposed, I think it's exposed, right? Is it called exposed or marked? Spotted. <clears throat> spotted, thank you. Yeah. Um, if they're spotted, then uh, every uh, shot from an archer on a spotted target takes full damage. There's, so uh, at range, archers have fall off. So the further away they are, the less damage they do. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have a spotted enemy, it does full damage no matter how far away you are. Um, the trick is that in order to pull that off with the ranging shot, it takes two turns, right? One shot to range them and spot them and another shot to do the damage. But there's a really cool spear skill that makes that easier. You can talk about the spear skill. <clears throat> yeah, so that's called marking strike. And essentially it's it's very much like we talked earlier. Like you want to deal damage. That That's why we have the, the wide attacks. But with everything in Rome, you have a wide attack and then it does something else. So instead of using marking strike on someone who's just going to die, you might as well use it on the character that you plan on hitting with your archer, because then the archer will have the benefits of the status effect which marking strike applies, which is spotted. So now you can apply spotted to the character you wanted to hit with the archer, stay very far behind, so you're out of threat of enemy fire, uh, assassins coming at you or whatever, and you can even use skills that have a shorter range but still do full damage and you don't have to use those two turns on doing it. And these are all the, the kind of demand dynamics. Like we already, I went down into how you can build up the he the heavy class, but then how do you start combining two characters and three characters and yeah. four characters? And this is just a combo from two characters, which is, is a really nice, uh, yeah, synergy. And we keep finding more and more of these that, yeah, just play really well together. 
Yeah, it's uh, we talked about the shield component. So it's like you may use um, the March strike with the spear to blow the shield down, yeah. which does two things. It spots the uh, enemy as well as knocks your shield down so they can take range yeah. damage. And so that's where you have those different ways of tackling a different circumstance. Maybe you use it to burn down a non-shielded character in one turn, or maybe you use it to burn down a shielded character in one turn based on knocking down that shield with the spear. Um, those combos and like, and again, you're right, we're alluding to just two characters. These daisy chains, <clears throat> it's almost like a Rube Goldberg machine, right? Like you can set up these different things where it's like, I'm gonna use Mark Strike on one guy, and then I'm gonna like refresh his action point with a support character, and then use Mark Strike on another guy, and then I'm gonna archers do AoE attacks to get full damage on both of them. And there's all these like crazy ways that you can combine these things together to do yeah. some really unique um, setups based on what you what you find fun. Yeah, I think like and it even happens to me, uh, and I I mean I know all the skills, I know all the steps of again. Sometimes it happens that you you have this daisy chain plan as you say and. There's something you didn't account for either that's a good thing or that's a bad thing but i find it more and more often that it's like wait now this character's stunned and then i didn't plan for that so instead of this other plan i had rework <laughs> we will do this other thing instead and it's like new opportunity also kind of arises to you from random stuff happening that stuff you didn't account for because a certain amount of chaos added to combat also means that you don't sit there for 20 minutes and just plan out the most perfect thing uh, because we really want this to kind of be more fast-paced. Uh, even though it's a yeah, turn-based game, you can take however much time you want. We have a bunch of systems, uh, both in code and design, that essentially lets you play the game much faster. Um, which I think is really cool. Yeah, I, I feel like um, the we're, we've talked a lot about the different uh, ways that these combat experiences work, but there are other elements that, again, it just shows the, the range of this thing. We also have like the tactical items, which are like... Sing, not, not single fire per se, but they're like non-skill based actions you can take that are sometimes charge based and they have a lot of different elements. Like there's the one that we actually show, if, if you guys haven't seen our gameplay trailer, um, <clears throat> highly recommend you check it out. But on one of the last scenes, there's that Greek fire bomb that you throw and that can light stuff on fire. And it's what's really interesting about the fire and actually QA have brought up this because there's been some bugs with it that we're still trying to fix. But um, uh, Greek fire can light the ground on fire depending on the surface type. So like if you're on a wooden ship or like on a wooden fort and you throw Greek fire down, all that wood can start spreading and you can create issues for both yourself and the enemies. Yeah. And then you combine that with others. Like there's that, that that's a whole another layer of like environment and map and how that also drives the encounters and how the even the items and the skills, uh, you know, interact with those things. So like you said, it's it's not like there's a lot of opportunity moments that are part of that fast reaction. We're like, oh crap, I'm gonna throw this thing on the ground and then watch it burn. And now there's four guys burning and they're scared and their morale is breaking and now they're running away and I'm gonna shoot them. It's, it's, there's a lot of those kind of fun moments that come through. Yeah, I think it's a lot of the, the chaos that we're kind of trying to introduce. And like the Greek fire jar is a great item. I, I don't think you should ever not use it, even though the fire might spread towards you. Um, that's, that's just how things is with some randomization in there, but then you might equip some armors that have some fire resistance and negate that if that's your play style, right? More freedom. Yeah, I watched, there's one video, we actually ended up not including it in our uh, in the, the B-roll footage that we gave out because it kind of exposed a really weird, like not bug, but just something that didn't quite work. But it was like, uh, it was one of the QA had done this thing and he said to me, he's like, dude, you can't use this, but this is hilarious. Where like he dropped the Greek fire and it was spreading too fast and it like, there was like five enemies that were all trapped in it. And since they were on fire, their morale started breaking. And so they were running and like hitting their allies to get them out of the way so they could escape the fire. <laughs> you had this entire like, um, like morale breaking, fleeing, scared sea of like basic units that are running away, fighting to get out of the way of the fire. And he's just sitting there back with archers, like peppering them as they're running. <laughs> it was hilarious. Like I, I watched this video and I'm like, that seems broken. Like we probably need to tune that a little bit, but also that's freaking crazy. Like that's fun to watch. Yeah, I guess that might be some live game design we could do right here. We could make a rule that probably you should only be fleeing if your morale is broken inside fire. So you're not, you don't start like panicking and hitting the wrong characters. Like it, there's cases where it gets weird, right? And these are a lot of the challenges that we then face when we need to, like when we make a game that is as deep as this and with as much freedom, because like I said earlier that it's possibly that you can beat the game with six arches. It might even be the best thing. I don't know. There's, there's so many combos that it's ridiculous and it's 
close to impossible for me to test. I need to actually like implement this stuff, right? And uh, we'll probably encounter some some combinations of stuff which is just outright ridiculous. And I, I think that it should also be allowed to some degree if the player finds something which is just like super fun and they discovered it, then I don't want to take that away from them, right? Um, but there's still also some kind of realism and yeah, limits to what yeah. we do. Wow. Yeah, it's definitely, you're definitely right. There's uh there's definitely um the the fire stuff is is uh quite interesting, and that's just one element, right? There's other elements too. So I think you'll have a lot of fun with the different um, things you can daisy chain. Well, uh, I, we have gotten a few questions, and by the way, if you want to start loading up questions, we're gonna bring Jonas back on here and uh, spend the last five or ten minutes answering questions. But Hans, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. So let's bring uh, Jonas back. And I saw at least one question on chat we can answer. And if you guys have other questions about anything, now is the time to throw them in chat. You got a, a, an extra five or six minutes here to answer them. By the way, um, I know I've mentioned this a couple times. The dev diaries uh, that talk about the topics before the streams are posted on our community site. It's down there at the bottom, community.expeditionsseries.com. Uh, we always take questions uh, from the forums first. So if you go on there and post a question to the diary, um, we'll make sure to answer that. Um, we I always check the questions uh, on Tuesday night before the stream and add those to my script, my handy dandy script that I got here. So if uh, you get plugged into our community and, and start reading the diaries and start asking questions there, um, you'll get the, the makers of the game to definitely uh, respond to it. So one question that um, came up uh, that I saw earlier, and I think this is actually kind of alluded to, but I think it's important to clarify. So Stefan one asked earlier, he said, uh, he or she, I'm not sure. Um, with many skills being based on equipment, is it viable to completely change combat roles of a character between fights or as the as the game progresses? To an extent, of course, you're you're still limited by your um, by your class skills and your class as such. Obviously, you can't change the subclass of your class on the fly. But the actual role of how you use that character in combat can change significantly based on what you've equipped. So yes. To some extent, you definitely can. You have a fair amount of flexibility based on what equipment you put on. Can you give a, a, maybe an example of like um, uh, what kind of skills may completely change the behavior of a, even like the same class, like in a way that you would use them completely differently? For example, characters that can equip uh, spears can also equip swords, and the skills that are on spears and swords can be quite different. And then they can combo differently with shields as well. So a character who, like, if you put a spear on a character with a shield, you can get access to some skills from that spear that you can follow as if you put it with shields. So you can turn a more tanky heavy into more of a damage dealer, or you can put uh, you can put a skill a weapon with more supports. Skill, support like skills onto uh, one of your your, your pipemen, for example, to make them a bit more of a, a buffer kind of character. There's a lot of a lot of changes. Yeah. yeah so there's a, there's a character that's uh, uh, near you in the background. If uh, I know that uh, uh, we're still going through some screenshots here, but when the when the image comes out, I've ever seen it's a guy uh, with the, with the toga. Um, he's uh, so in the game there are companion characters, which are kind of like the. I mean, there's also non-companion characters you can play with too, but the companion characters are kind of your core group you play with. And Cineros is um, a companion character that can be built and used as a support character, um, both with the class skills that they use as well as the weapons that they get. Um, but I've definitely sometimes used uh, Cineros as a ranged, like a, a medium range damage dealer very often, actually. Like if I get a really powerful uh, weapon, I've sometimes shifted him to be like the person that finishes people off after the frontline um, shielded guys do their damage. And that's one of those things where I feel like sometimes Cineros is a guy that's buffing and healing and I've used those skills on him before, but sometimes it's much better to use him as like a backup range dealer. Um, that can go through, they can weaken a shield for the archers too. Cause that, you know, it, again, it's that range. Like imagine like you hit a shield and it has like this much left and you're ready for that archer to pummel it. You gotta get that one little bit off. Cineros is really good to do that part. I think that uh, the, the Triarius, as that class is called, is one of the most flexible classes in the game. They, 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 it's also the, one of the ones that has the most distinct differences between its subclasses, whether you build that as a as a healer, a curer character to, to get bad status effects off of your, your friends or heal them back up or to buff them so that they deal more damage, or whether you go into the destroyer subtree uh, and just kind of focus on getting them armor shred so they can wear down the armor of a particularly powerful enemy or you know, stand behind the shield guy and jab them with a with a long ass pike. 
that's uh, it makes a big difference to how you use those characters. It's actually there's also, uh, there's also that skill that um, has the um, like the whole system of focus, which we haven't talked about much. There's a class that has this resource called focus, and but you can equip non-focus based weapons on that character too. So being able to use like um, uh, focus or not focus, and how you can like decide, okay, I'm gonna grab two focus weapon, or I'm gonna grab a focus weapon, or use something that maybe as a skill that I want to use instead, like that can change the way you use, um, I think, um, uh, Bestia, but I can't remember the name of the class that does the focus stuff. It's, uh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. It's a whole other whole dynamic. So, I mean, I think the, the, the long answer of it is that step on one, there's a lot of different ways that you can, um, shift how different classes play, even inside their class. And that can be different trees in the class that you build or the skills that you get from different weapons or, 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 uh, <laughs> If you want to call shields a weapon, uh, different shields or other items that you get. Um, they are weapons. <laughs> <laughs> With the last couple of minutes we have left before we um, wrap it up, can you? We talked. We touched a little bit on tactical items. Um, maybe you can give. And we mentioned the the um, the the Greek fire. What are other examples of tactical items that you can use to have more flexibility in combat? I guess I can talk a little bit about tactical items. Essentially, they're stuff that which you need to find in the world, uh, just like items. And that's why all tactical items are also charge based. Essentially, if you find a bunch of pilums, which are Roman javelins, you only have X amount of them. Um, you need to figure out how you get the materials for them, the schematics so that you can craft them. And then once you've used them enough in combat, you'll have to replenish them. Um, and that's different oh. compared to other skills in combat from weapons, which might also have charges, but they'll recharge between every encounter. Whereas the tactical items, you'll have to spend resources on gaining those back, essentially. And so uh, I think some of like the meta metagame systems where you have yeah. some resource management and some resource collection that you're trying to use to both craft weapons and armors, but also to keep your tactical items refreshed or rebuilt so you can use them uh, more flexibly. Yeah. So a decision, yeah, a decision we actually made, I think about a month or two ago was that all tactical items should be free actions as Jonas also sp spoke about earlier. Uh, and this was a decision we made because you put so much effort into finding these and we, we even kind of mark them as legendary items. Like they're quite unique in how they work and you don't have that many of them, you need to spend resources. So let's make that kind of a thing of the uh, epic Roman fighters. They can do this one extra thing. They just need to spend the actual resources on them. Uh, and I think one of my favorite, except from the Greek fire, because chaos is always uh, awesome, but we talked about that. I think one of my favorite combos that kind of also came out of the blue is um, a combination of two tactical items we have one of which is throwing knives which is quite simple you select three different targets throw a knife and it deals a range of damage um, so you can either nuke one guy or split the damage with some small pokes and then a bit later in the game after having found the throwing knives already you can find a poison vial which can encode your weapon so any damage you deal um, will apply poison to characters this works with weapon skills, but this also works with the throwing knives. So you put on the poison vial, and then you put on three different guys and make sure that it's nice to spread out and the poison will just start spreading and wreaking even more havoc than the Greek fire. I know, so uh, I didn't even know, I knew about the poison vial thing, but I didn't know it comboed with the other tactical items. Well, that, that's pretty much, I, that, that's sometimes what I experience as well. Like I use a skill and it's like, as I said, this guy is now stunned because of this other thing, and yeah, 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 that, yeah. that's where I really enjoy it. It's especially great right? when you have a moment where you go, wow, that's way too powerful. We're definitely leaving that in. Like, this is the worst, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The worst idea. We're keeping it. <laughs> it is something we've been doing more and more. Yeah, yeah it's actually, uh, I mean, I am going to name drop this one, but it's, it's, I think it's something that uh, also comes to me when games like Diablo 3, where it's like they... They actually they, they did a talk about this once at a, a game developers conference where they really wanted everything to feel overpowered. Like they wanted the player to equip something and combine these skills together and be like, oh my gosh, I am wrecking face. This is so much fun. Um, I think part of the Rome fun is discovering these different ways that you can combine different things together and be like, man, all right, so now I'm daisy chaining, throwing knives to poison at the start that then starts spreading and then I can do things like, yeah, that's that's yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's yeah, very much what I call you go, Jonas. Okay, I mean, a, a, a big part of the underlying philosophy behind that is also the fantasy of being a, a fairly small elite force of Romans against these overwhelming 
hordes of barbarians, mm. essentially. Like, you, you want to feel like a tanky, well-equipped, well-trained soldier against a bunch of, you know, farmers with pitchforks who showed up to defend their land against these invaders, right? And that yeah. involves making it really powerful so we can send tons of enemies at you. Awesome. Well, I think that's it. I'm going to take the one last uh, quick question. Uh, Fijor, by the way, thanks for the comments on the visuals. Um, in two streams, not the next one, but the one after that. We're going to actually have our art director on here, and we're going to talk about all the visuals and art of the game. It's going to be a lot of fun. August is a great guy, and uh, there's a lot of really cool um, visuals we can show about, um, not just uh, the actual in-game stuff, but the concept art that led to them. I think you'll really enjoy that if you like the art style of the game. So uh, mark your calendars. I think it's in about five weeks. Um, but you can track all of that on our community site, so community.expeditionseries.com. Um, that's where our dev diaries are posted, our calendars posted on there, so you know when the next diary and stream are going to go live. Um, and you can get plugged in and, and, and ask questions and everything. So really encourage you to join. Um, we do not have any missions where you can control a ship. Uh, we do have multiple missions that take place on the ships, um, and uh, you'll have fights on those, and, and you'll get to have some of those uh, those cool moments. So the trimune does look really awesome, um, but no, you can't control them. Uh, that's <laughs> that, that, that would have probably made even more designer heads explode. The game is big enough. <laughs> Us Romans were terrible at naval combat. Just historically <laughs> awful. That's true too, right? You don't want to like do the worst part of their history. Um, Jonas and Hans, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. Good yeah, dive into combat. Thanks for having us. It was really yeah. fun. I, I hope to, to be back. There's, there's plenty of stuff we have in Toshi Bun. So uh, any guys who have a question, just feel free to, to PM me or write in, yeah, on Discord. I'll, I'll be there answering or Fasia Jonas will for sure as well. Yeah, and, and don't forget the, the forums. We're also very active there and uh, driving conversations there too. So uh, thanks everyone again for the stream and uh, we will see you next time. Take care, everybody.